OK, so it's now 10 past the hour. So I guess it's a good time to kick off. So good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this side event on the future of cannabis in the Caribbean. It's organized by the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam, the Interdisciplinary Center for Cannabis Research at the University of the West Indies and the Global Drug Policy Observatory at Swansea University in the UK. And it's connected to a research project funded by the UK RI Global Challenges Research Fund. My name's Dave Bewley taylor I'm the director of the GDPR at Swansea University, and it's my pleasure to be moderating today's session. So for those of you who've been following the CND, um, at this point in the week, you will be well aware that this year marks a number of significant anniversaries of several international drug policy instruments that have far reaching effects at a global level. Now, while of course interconnected, today our focus is more specifically regional in nature and relates directly to an important Caribbean community report presented at the CND in Vienna two years ago. And I'm referring, of course, to the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana's Waiting to Exhale, Safeguarding Our Future Through Responsible Socio-Legal Policy on Marijuana. Responding to increasing calls from the public, from NGOs and other stakeholders in the region, and amidst the changing global environment, the Commission was established to interrogate the issue of possible reform to the legal regimes relating to cannabis in CARICOM countries. And within this context, of course, cannabis for medical purposes is clearly a key, if not the only, issue for interrogation. And over the course of our presentations, Today, we'll learn about the implementation of legal medical cannabis models in the region, but particularly the challenges to developing inclusive policies and designing business models in which traditional cannabis cultivators can be a central part. Now, in this regard, I think it's important to recall some of the outcomes of the public consultation process undertaken for the report. Um, as the Commission Chair notes, those spoke to broad issues that moved way beyond the narrow constraints of medical marijuana to embrace notions of social justice, human rights, economics, regional hegemony and their right to health. The question then is how much progress has been made since the report's publication in 2018? So to speak to this, we have a wonderful panel comprising not only government officials from the region, but also representatives from academia and an NGO. Now each speaker, as is the norm, will have about six minutes for their presentations. Uh, again, as is the norm, I encourage you, the audience to ask questions via the chat function. I'm hoping that we'll have plenty of time for some Q&A after the presentations. And since we're in a Zoom, meeting format, I'd appreciate it if those in the audience could please make sure that your microphones are off throughout the session. So with that housekeeping out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Gerald Thompson, Executive Director of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But before I hand over to Gerald, I'm sure that everyone would like to join me in taking this opportunity to send our support and best wishes to all those in SVG affected by the recent volcanic activity, including traditional cannabis cultivators. So without further ado, Gerald, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, I wish to thank um, you everyone for their kind sentiments and their prayers. This has been a very tough and trying period for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I would say for the Caribbean, firstly, with respect to the crippling global COVID-19 pandemic and other socioeconomic fallouts and challenges. It has been two years since liberalization of the medicinal cannabis industry in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, the establishment of what we consider as a robust credible regulatory framework and 
a special carve out that we called the amnesty program to transition traditional cultivators who are at the heart and the core of, I would say the long cannabis tradition and fully fairly and favorably into incorporate them into the industry and its future growth. St. Vincent is considered as a natural greenhouse with the most ideal weather and climatic characteristic. Two unique enabling attributes stand out. One, the first is the presence of a rare, highly fertile volcanic soil called Moloch Andersol, which only occupies about 0.84% of the Earth's crust and was derived from previous volcanic eruptions, setting a potential for geographical indication status in the future. But the second and probably even more important is the experience of and dedication of the traditional cultivators. Um, we learned from a visit to Canada that their recent embrace of outdoor cultivation and grow operations, um, which was similar to ours, was quite cost effective compared to indoor grow and still produced a high quality, more natural product. Now this reassured us and we successfully built on the experience of our traditional cultivators with training in good agricultural and collection practices, GACP, to an extent that we realize many of the TCs, as we call them, were master growers in their own right. We also realize that in order for St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Caribbean to be a player, in the global market, we had to modernize and brand and ensure there was several things. One, a state-of-the-art analytical laboratory testing services to verify the quality. B, the development of heat, humidity, mold, mildew, and drought-resistant strains and see the preservations of our own precious land races, and D, the supporting cannabis tissue culture, which we've been developing and breeding research to attain the quality, quantity, and consistency of the plants needed. We felt that in view of the pandemic, um, a Caribbean branded tourism was one important approach for the future. But also, we are still very dedicated to being an export-oriented medicinal cannabis industry. Um, and th th that would be a major part of the economic recovery and our future. Now, unfortunately, as you have all heard and you mentioned, Mr. Taylor, that on April 9th, one week ago, we had a massive, explosive volcanic eruption, forcing the evacuation of 15,000 persons from the red and orange zone communities near the volcano. This has destroyed 90% of the farms in the north of the island, fruit trees, animals, and livelihoods, displacing the TCs, their families, who are now evacuees, and St. Vincent the Grenadines plunged into another crisis. While 20% of the major investors and licensed cultivators so far um, further south on the island, are only 20% only have had moderate to severe uh, uh, damages. The, the industry has still uh, been considered to have had a serious blow. Now, our Garifuna history, a previous eruption experience in 1979, and the sheer will and resilience of the Vincentian people have taught us that St. Vincent the Grenadines will and has always bounced back very fast. While most investors have already harvested their first crop, which was professionally grown, well-documented GACP grade, um, it, it, was, it was securely stored, um, they now eye legal export. It may take months 
for farmers, the TCs, to get back to their lands. However, the ash um, may well likely spur even greater soil fertility um, so that many persons may benefit once they're back on their farms. We appreciate that when it is considered safe to do so, there would also be streams of sightseers and visitors, tourists coming to visit the seat of volcano to experience the whole medicinal industry culture that we're looking to create here in St. Vincent the Grenadines. Um, the TCs will require every possible help and assistance they can receive after lost farms, homes, and livelihoods. We in St. Vincent believe there is an opportunity to market TC grown products, which can help rebuild their livelihoods while we also promote an export industry. Recently, we would have had discussions with Antigua and Barbados with the whole concept of again, looking at interstate and, and seeing if these could be a survey possible when we wanna learn more about this concept. But the UN CND's vote um, in November last finally acknowledged the medicinal benefits of cannabis. While the TCs and Rastafari have been stating this for almost three quarters of a century while crying in the wilderness. The MCA and the government of St. Vincent Green will do all that it can to ensure they have a fair and permanent seat at the table that they benefit in any Caribbean thrust. And there is a response to their proud cry and plea for assistance. I wanna thank you very much. I look forward to answering any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Gerald, for that wonderful overview of the situation within SVG and, and uh, the central place of what you call TCs, the traditional cultivators uh, within the emerging system there. And I have to say, I admire your, your positivity around the current situation and highlighting the symbiosis between the volcanic activity and the fertility of the soil and therefore the, the marijuana uh, crops um, within the island. So thank you very much for that. So from the S S as from SVG, we now move um, northwest across the Caribbean. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker. It's Faith Graham. Uh, Faith is the CEO of the Jamaican Cannabis Licensing Authority. The floor is yours, Faith. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here to share. Um, I'm anticipating from a, a robust regional cannabis industry. And, you know, I just wanted to really congratulate our, our Caribbean counterparts for their for, for launching their regimes and so on. St. Vincent, my heart goes out to you. You know, we know that you will bounce back because we can hear the resilience in your voice on alone. You know, so just want to acknowledge Antigua and Barbuda, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, um, Trinidad and Tobago for their regime. Trinidad and Tobago recently um, launched their cannabis control bill and invited our comments on, on it. And that is like the beginning of partnership. We have also been having um, information sharing sessions with Barbados, which is very good for the industry and for the region, you know, because um, through these discussions, we can find ways to tap into that hegemony that we speak of. Um, implementation of the legal medical cannabis industry. Well, in Jamaica, um, our legislation, the Dangerous Drugs Act was amended in 2015 to establish the CLA. And the CLA has since promulgated interim regulations to manage the industry. Um, for, and we are responsible for both hemp and ganja. Um, now we issue five license types at this time and up to today we have issued 78. Um, we have cultivators licenses, processing licensing, retail, herb houses, research and development licenses and transportation licenses. Now, um, there, there, we have made provision in our um, interim regulations for inclusion of the small farmers, small subsistence farmers, and of course, we can't leave out traditional farmers. We kind of make a subtle distinction there in terms of the, 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 the um, genesis of the different um, cultivations. Now, Jamaica, all of the provisions that we've made in our existing regulations include um, allowing applicants to be 
cooperatives and friendly societies, you know, we we know that um, financing is usually a challenge. So we have provision for waivers and deferment of fees and our even payment plans. In the Caribbean region, we have land ownership challenges always. And what we have sought to do through our regulation is to um, allow persons to use land once we can get statutory declarations to say that they have claim to this land. And also um, if they have consent to, of the owner of the land to use the land. So that is how we enable um, access without even having the certificate of title. Um, of course, the, the, the law makes provision for expungement. So a lot of our traditional farmers might have had uh, run-ins with the law because of even simple possession of maru, of ganja, we, as we call it, and um, would have excluded them otherwise. So the expungements really do tap into that after a certain period of time. No, notwithstanding all of these provisions, we find that there are challenges and um, to, 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 to access, mainly, mainly stemming from um, the ability to access financing because of the correspondent banking issues that still um, are prominent in, in the cannabis industry. The banks are de-risking and therefore do not want to support cannabis businesses. So they'll tell us in principle, they support the industry, but at the same time, they're not willing to risk their correspondent banking relationships that we have with the United States and even the insurance companies too. Um, so we're looking also testing and standards. These are things that can exclude persons. So of course, what we have sought to do because they are, they are necessary for safe consumption, both locally and abroad, where the, the authority has made um, significant progress in partnering with others to enable testing. And also our local Bureau of Standards has promulgated seven standards for the industry, which we are seeking to incorporate in our regulations. We have now taken another approach to the inclusion issue for the um, small subsistence farmers, being that the provisions thus far, have the optic has not been great. And so um, we have recently con conceptualized a cultivator's transitional special permit which is specifically um, geared towards small subsistence farmers as an avenue to get them into the medical cannabis industry. What it will do, it, we, they will be issued with a permit which will allow them to enter the industry, um, but at reduced cost and reduced infrastructural build out whilst maintaining all the security requirements. So the cost factor is what is prohibitive and this, is, this permit it has cut it in half for them cut the price of the license in half, cut down the infrastructural requirements, and they are able to trade with other licensees, with licensees. And over, we expect that over 24 months period, they will incrementally matriculate to becoming a full licensee. And this is not a renewable, this is not a renewable permit, so that they have to, that we, so we will provide the guidance with them to help them to get to that point. Now, if we see them approaching their 24 month period and not being able to matriculate, then we, we have the discretion to give them an additional six months to complete their transition process. And by the end of that process, they should be able to be a cultivator's tier one licensee, which would have the full benefit of license, which would cause them to be able to export, among other things. Now, um, we are there signs that we are moving away from medical cannabis? Well, um, from the medical cannabis regime? Well, Jamaica at this point is not seeking to move away from the medical cannabis regime. But what we have done, we have accepted and acknowledged um, issues of social justice and human rights. Um, we, of course, through the amendments, we, we allow the, um, the use of sacramental use of cannabis by Rastafarians. That's a, that, that's a human rights issue, which is um, governed by our Ministry of Justice. And of course, decriminalization of the position of small quantities, which is, which is a social justice issue, because we find that a lot of our young people would have been you know, totally disadvantaged because of a simple spliff, as we call it here. right? And so we believe that though there are economic benefits to be gained, through the medical cannabis industry. So we don't necessarily have to depart from that regime to, to tap into that economic space. What we think is best is that we, we focus on how 
to enable the industry and maximize the opportunities that reside within the medical cannabis regime. And in so doing, we have not now recognized that our interim regulations will certainly need overhauling for more ease of doing business. Um, it will also include additional income streams for the authority, right? We're looking to, we're about to promulgate in import export regulation, which will also provide access to other markets, which will help us. We are, um, we, have, we have the first draft of our hemp regulations and for us, hemp is just for medical purposes. So the, the, the cannabinoid profile of it, 1% are less THC of course, and 10% are more CBD because that is what we're doing it for. And we have chosen that threshold so that we can, um, as a medical medical industry that we're promoting for CBD in, the, in hemp, right? So we don't do industrial hemp because of the inherent risks of cross-pollination and we're very small in Jamaica to cross-pollination is a risk to both the hemp and ganja industries. So in so doing, we have chosen to put in that threshold. We're also seeking to strengthen the regulatory framework to allow for authorizations and permits, also another income earner for the country and of course for the people. Um, and during COVID, we had to develop um, an online sales policy for the retail herb houses, right? And even beyond COVID, it will become something that is necessary as the industry is evolving. So while we're not departing from medical, we are, we are maximizing what we can do. So we're looking now to develop a policy to augment the online sales policy that we have, a policy for deliveries. Now, our um, regime as it is, it restricts trade um, amongst licensees. Our industry has expanded, has grown beyond that now. So we are now seeking to find ways to extend trade outside of that, what we call the closed loop system, um, to increase access to other markets and so on, to include others in the industry. So of course, in order to increase this global access, then we have to, of course, do our regulations for import export. The um, standards are, are absolutely necessary. We would be seeking to incorporate some of those into our regulatory framework as well. Good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices, among several others. Um, and product diversification, of course. Um, the whole matter of nutraceuticals, some say edibles. Um, I believe We believe that we need to recognize traditional medical ganjas are cannabis as traditional medicine and we can do this through a nutraceutical market which would include but not be limited to tinctures topical treatments sublingual applications teas etc right um so and the recent decision to remove cannabis from the schedule four we believe is i mean it is it is legitimized cannabis in so many more ways because now we can it's recognized by the right bodies that cannabis has this medicinal value. And so what we have seen is an increase in demand locally for expansion of the space. So that is why even more so now, we would need to um, increase the supply chain by trading outside of that closed loop system, um, focusing on of course um, CBD and expanding the class of medical practitioners that may um, prescribe or recommend the cannabis for medical purposes. We must recognize our local herbalists or neutral, um, naturopath practitioners because they can be recognized and should be recognized in law to, uh, to be able to prescribe cannabis for medical purposes. Okay, okay. Um, Faith, we just, um, can you begin to wrap it up, please? It's fascinating. Sure, I'm just going to right. So um, research and development is, um, one, is a way that we think with the 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 the, um, the the region ought to go for the the whole idea of hegemony and so on and of course intellectual property and that is essentially is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Faith, for, for cramming so much uh, important information in such a short period of time. So those yes. are fascinating points. Um, so what jumped out for me particularly was this idea of you, you came back to the regional hegemony a couple of times in, in terms of um, looking at the markets and also information sharing, which I think is very interesting. And then of course, the special permit for the small subsistence farmers, I think is obviously you know, key to this discussion. So thank you very much for teeing up those issues. So we'll now thank move you. on to uh, Vicky Hansen. So Vicky is at the Interdisciplinary Center for Cannabis Research 
at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. And Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I, I'm, I'm want to pick up from some of the points made by both Gerald and um, Faith in their presentation this morning, because as we have mentioned, and let me start by sending out thoughts to our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and by extension, those in Barbados and St. Lucia, who are also affected by La Sofere volcano. And we are looking at the future of cannabis in the Caribbean um, based on where we were before in terms of the waiting to exhale report. And for me, two of the main points that I want to focus this presentation on is has to do with our environmental conditions and considerations that the report pointed out was something that is key, which we are now living in this time as it relates to the volcanic uh, eruption in St. Vincent. And in last November, we here in Jamaica had our own environmental con conditions as it relates to our rainfall and storm that affected our small traditional growers. And one of the things that we have learned from this experience that will impact how we go forward with our own regulation of cannabis in the Caribbean is that we are indeed environmentally vulnerable, especially our ch small traditional growers. We have traditional growers who are using land that are in areas that are not, uh, not good for farming, much less for cannabis farms. And so we have a situation in St. Vincent now where traditional farmers who have been farming in unsuitable conditions now have to run, leave their crops. Their livelihoods are now being destroyed because of cultivating in a space that is very volatile. So they are now displaced. Does the current regulatory framework help to take those into consideration. I know Ms. Graham just mentioned the whole matter of land and land availability, access to land. That is something that the report spoke to in 2018 that still remain with us, even in our medical framework. So we have to look at making the amendments to our various legislation to provide access to small traditional farmers and if we want to call them small farmers. It is more than saying to them, we will give you permission to use the land. They also will have to go to some big landowner to get that permission. So we have to look at, at how we regulate in that space and treat with that. Again, another issue, the way of growing. I think Gerald mentioned the good agricultural practices one of the things that is needed from our small traditional farmers is adequate upskilling of how they do their agricultural practices. Because what we're seeing both in Jamaica, both in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, if they can't meet certain standards by virtue of that alone, they are also excluded from a medicinal industry. Which brings me, and, and, and I'm glad to hear Faith Graham of Jamaica mentioning, looking at how we regulate and regulating for health, but, and to know that we have a certain practice within the Caribbean and other cultural practice that sees and accepts the traditional medicines. Now that is an area that is still not clear and it still leaves our naturopaths or, or folk medicines not being accepted in a really solid way. And if we're serious about a uh, medicinal or uh, cannabis for medicinal use, the whole matter of cultural medicine and cultural uh, identified practices must be taken into consideration in our regulation of the cannabis industry going forward. But do we really have just a medicinal cannabis industry in the Caribbean? The truth is 
No, we have a cultural industry as well. We have a sacramental industry. Do we leave it vaguely? So we need to also take into consideration elements of our UN convention that speaks to our rights, our cultural rights and our human rights as it relates to cultural rights. And so there must be a space there must be more than just to say Rastafari is given sacramental use to just use this in their space. Can I trade my sacramental uh, plan? So there must be a recognition that there is a cultural space that goes beyond med just traditional medicine and sacrament, but a cultural use of the plan in its all its forms. So the, and, and that is one of the things that our report from the, the Marijuana Commission pointed out that there needs to be a serious conversation in the Caribbean as it re relates to recognition of cultural rights, human rights to use. And then when we are regulating, do we do like Jamaica and you split across the, the regulation of cannabis and leave Ministry of Justice to deal with the sacrament and the justice issue? No, because it goes back to the old getting involved in the industry. While I can get my record expunged for small quantities that I will use for my sacramental use, why not get my record expunged for larger cultivation so that I can seriously enter an industry and build a legitimate livelihood? And these are some of the concerns that we would have highlighted from our report that we did on the review of the licensing regime in 2020 in Jamaica. These were some of the points that came out, a few of the points, in the interest of time, I wouldn't be able to go through, but those are some of the, the points that have been highlighted by the small traditional growers. They want that space. And it, it has been, those points have been, re, have been reiterated in many reports, even another report done by uh, Martin and yourself, uh, Dave and Sylvia, that spoke to dealing with that issue of the UN treaties and their acceptance of certain uh, rights, cultural rights, dealing with the regulatory challenges as well that talks about the banking issues, which I think Ms. Graham had just mentioned in her own uh, presentation. And also, facilitating and supporting the growth and, and the organization of the, of the growers, the traditional growers. We need to have frameworks in place that will support the growth and organization of these uh, communities. I know Geraldine in, in St. Vincent, they have the transitional license with the CRC, which is the Cannabis Revival Committee. So it is bringing these organizations into the discussion about how we regulate for the future because the future is built on their inclusion in, in it. So these are just some of the points I want to raise. I'll clarify some in the question and answer section, um, Dave. But in the interest of time, thank you all. Wonderful, thank you, Vicky. Again, another overview of the situation and um, highlighting many many of the challenges um, uh, within the current context including as you noted the, the environmental vulnerability but also issues around land access which I think are obviously hugely important upskilling and I think of particular note here for us today is this this notion of as you described it as a cultural slash sacramental industry and how you've got those really strong connections with human rights and cultural rights and how within the current international system you can see regime complexes banging against each other against each other and generating um and points of tension so thank you very much for introducing us to all those those ideas so our final speaker then is um p Matal from the transnational institute in the netherlands um p the floor is yours hello good afternoon morning evening wherever you are thank you very much dave for uh helping uh, moderating this uh, i think we have a lot of 
people present. We actually reached the maximum of, of, of attendance. So uh, maybe there's some people who would have liked to join us, but they, they couldn't because we've reached 100 maximum. Um, thank you also your my fellow presenters to share your views on the future of uh, cannabis. Uh, I would like to start to express my solidarity with the people of St. Vincent and particularly all those directly affected by the outburst of the volcano, amongst whom are many cannabis cultivators, as we know, and the many other uh, people in the region feeling the negative impacts of the ashes that are going around. Growing on such fertile, fertile land brings wonders, but uh, carries enormous risks, as uh, we have seen. So um, I would like to use this opportunity to present uh, a new report that uh, the Transnational Institute has made. Um, it's called a sustainable future for cannabis farmers, alternative development opportunities in the legal cannabis market, which is quite relevant for this discussion on the future of cannabis in the Caribbean, but also in other parts of the world. You can see uh, the slide here and you can also see the link later or to download it directly from our website. <clears throat> After more than uh, 50 years of policies that pretend to find a solution to cannabis cultivation as a result of its prohibition, not too much has changed. As you will find in the report in detail, the early ideas around crop substitution during the 1960s in countries such as Lebanon and Morocco have fed into policies of alternative development and shared responsibilities. Two concepts that have evolved around the question how cannabis cultivators until this uh, could be provided with an alternative livelihood until this very day in the UN. What this report shows is the immense gap between theory and practice and the hard fact that AD in its current form has not worked and will not work for overwhelming majority of communities involved in this kind of a cultivation. <clears throat> the report argues it is time for change and that this discussion now needs to be revised given the change in circumstances. Although prohibition has not ended, an increasing number of countries around the world are challenging the global regime by allowing a legal outlet for cannabis. We argue in this report these changes should provide a part of the answer for those for the issue at stake, a sustainable future for cannabis farmers, requires their involvement in the emerging and fast developing medical cannabis industry. The rich history of cannabis and its use around the world is reflected in this report, which has always been a very effective and useful resource for people until its prohibition changed that faith. In historical terms, this delusion is based on confusion and moral uh, opinions more than on science and on logic, and now is finally starting to be repaired. Although the looming danger of a complete pharmaceutical capture is unfortunately quite real. And the only way to prevent this from happening lies in the hands of our policymakers. This report was a joint effort of several authors led by the program director, Martin Yelsma. It describes the extent of the subsistence economies seen, seen from the perspective of all global traditional communities that are involved in the cultivation of the plant. It provides analysis of all regions in the world from Asia, Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean and gives an overview of the newest developments of policies for legal cannabis regularity frameworks around the world. An interesting perspective that has surfaced in some countries is the concept of alternative development with cannabis, which was actually inspired by the Bolivian model for development with coca. We argue in this report that trading cannabis must become inclusive, a fair trade, in order to address the issue of poverty and the marginalization of communities now facing economic hardships. 
One chapter in this report will inform the reader on the risk of corporate capture of the global medicinal, medicinal cannabis markets that the global medicinal carbon market is now facing and what an inclusive business at the global and the global value chain offer in terms of an alternative that will help build a fairer trade and sustainable development. Aiming at finding a broader perspective on the matter of rural development, the report also reflects an attempt to grasp, grasp the dynamics of agrarian change. How does land, labor and capital interact with cannabis production? And to what extent the environmental impact of cannabis cultivation can be appreciated and dealt with? Furthermore, it must be obvious for, the, for most that questions around identity, race and gender are also relevant to this change. So these are also included in this report. Policy changes and the fast growing legal cannabis market may offer new opportunities for small farmers to transition into legality. Although to date there has been little progress in this regard. Barriers to entry are high and few protective legislative measures provide prefer preferential access to small producers. The reality is that the billion dollar medicinal cannabis market has been captured by big corporations and that the emerging legally regulated markets for non-medical recreational use are strictly based on an import substitution model pushing out the previous suppliers from traditional producing countries. If the regulation trend continues to move in this direction, the livelihoods of millions of small farmers in the South are at risk. This report argues that the international community needs to acknowledge that alternative development in its, origi in its original sense of shifting to other lucrative crops and income sources is no longer a viable policy perspective for cannabis, if it ever was. The report will give you some concrete suggestions for alternative development with cannabis, making use of the new opportunities offered by the expanding legal cannabis markets. We of course highly recommend you to read this report and we are looking forward to receiving your feedback. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Pien. Uh, thank you for, uh, uh, again, a wonderful overview of the contents of what I think is clearly going to be a, a, an important and groundbreaking report, very timely covering uh, a vast array of, I think, critical issues around um, what you've called subsistence economies. And I think the one of the critical points that you mentioned is the need to engage with traditional farmers now on the ground floor as the as the business and the, the this new industry is beginning to evolve. Okay, so looking at the clock, um, I'd just like to say thank you to all our um, presenters today, set it up wonderfully for some questions. So we have got time for some questions, which I will try to moderate fairly here. So I'll kick off with one from uh, Nicholas Martinez to everyone which speaks directly to something that Pien just mentioned. Uh, Nicholas asks, which mechanisms have the Caribbean countries to protect the small traditional cannabis farmers from multinational corporations? So really this is an issue about corporate capture, I guess. So um, can I first of all go to Gerald on this question? Gerald, would you like to respond to that a little? Yes, you know, we essentially have a process within our um, legal and regulatory structure that uh, an investor who basically must purchase um, a certain amount of product, a percentage of product from a traditional cultivator. Um, there are a number of licensees who were manufacturing only. In other words, they were not getting into cultivation. We wrestled with this, but they're not a full service process, they're into manufacturing with the intent of processing for export. And they too are looking to purchase 100% of their products from traditional cultivators. Of course, 
That means that whole process of GACP and making sure that all the traditional cultivators and so forth are within that framework can serve and that there's some exclusionary processes. But I think we've been, you know, doing quite well with that training. It's just that we have to do this a lot more intensely to make sure. And a lot of the GACP is documentation, that whole process of being able to document what is really being done. Uh, because we already feel that the fair quality is fairly high. How do you document that, you, that, that your processes are, are right? So I think that um, that model is, uh, um, a, a quite an acceptable model. Traditional cultivators can and are allowed within the framework to export themselves, but the, 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 the technical barriers to trade and so forth will always look to rest restrict that particular process. And um, we, we, we've, we're trying to carve out the, the, that, that, that pathway for them to go. Okay, thanks, Gerald. Faith, would you like to add anything to that? Could you put your mic mic on, please, Faith? Thanks. Right. Actually, some of what he said, I, it resonates with me because, um, in terms of having those those um, those farmers having a, um, a a carved out market for them, for when that is part of what of the vision of our transitional permit, so that they will be they will be aligned with 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 other licensed cultivators or or processors who will who will who will have to um, engage in taking a certain amount of their cannabis from these people. So we have special um, provisions for that in terms of whatever contractual arrangements. Otherwise, we, in our re regulation as it is, we have a clause for substantial ownership and control for Jamaicans or persons ordinarily resident in Jamaica, some amount of protection for our people that we don't have all these investors coming and taking over everything in the industry. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Faith. And um, Vicky, would you like to uh, speak to this point? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, definitely, it is something that is of concern for the traditional growers, because while, and we would appreciate both approaches of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Jamaica to ensure that when these growers come in um, to, or attempt to come in the industry, there is an outlet for them to supply. However, the, the, the feeling is that they are going to be overwhelmed by these corporations and they now become more of labor rather than source of, of supply. And so the regulations need to be clear. And I think going forward, it is more than saying, okay, you can supply to this big company because it would mean that the traditional growers will have to meet the terms and conditions of big corporations. And I think this goes to a question that I see in the chat. What is the market space that you are creating for these small traditional cultivators. So are we just looking at them meeting an export market that let us speak the truth, no, doesn't exist now or will exist until there are significant changes in the UN conventions, right? Because we are now looking at the barrier to import export because countries are insular because there is this UN convention that governs trade in cannabis. It, it can only be under certain con conditions. And so in looking at corporate capture, we have to look at it in the big picture of the industry that we are building. So it is to say that we need to have an industry that goes beyond just the medicinal and the pharmacological appreciation of, all right, we're going to meet the standards of big pharma and big company. What market space are we creating in the domestic environment, in the international environment? Are we looking at the cultural, and I come back to this conversation, the cultural rights to trade with my, just like how we would do reggae music. And so it also brings in intellectual property rights. 
So these are some issues that we have to hammer down before we can look at saying, okay, we can just prevent corporate capture because corporate capture is a big picture. And if we do not strengthen the traditional growers with all, in all aspects, we are running the risk of having that done to the industry. Okay, thanks, Vicky. Um, if it's all right with you, Peen, we'll probably skip asking you because I know that the report that you've just been presenting today will, contains an awful lot about this. So again, it's an opportunity to advertise the report for everyone on the call. Um, but just in the interest of time, one, one last question. We've run over a couple of minutes, if that's okay with everyone. But it does actually speak to something that Vicky mentioned. And this is from Sylvia Kay. Hi, Sylvia. Um, she, she asks, where do the speakers see the most potential in terms of market development? So domestic markets and attracting tourism, um, something that, that Gerald spoke to, regional trade with uh, the Caribbean, export to European, North American medical markets, or all of the above. And as a follow up, what are some of the major opportunities and challenges related to developing these markets? So can I go to you first, Gerald, on that bundle of questions that I've just thrown in your Yes. Direction? You know, I look at corporate capture in two respect as it relates to this question. There is a company coming into St. Vincent or Jamaica or the Caribbean and how does it interact? And then I look at the competition that the Caribbean has with other jurisdictions, such as Canada or if the United States opens up and so forth. I still don't quite understand the vote at the UN in terms of whether you know, it seemed to be in a reversal of the 1961, the countries that supported, um, you know, in 1961 were the one who wanted liberalization and the ones who were against, the, you know, moving on to the, the, the single convention and now want to sustain what is there. And so I am curious if those individuals, so with the Russias and so forth, the African countries were just suspicious that certain other countries wanted to get the international capture that would prevent any Caribbean island, as a Caribbean as a whole, gaining such access in terms of the industry. So, but I think that we have to look at one, some aspect of collaboration, and then based on quality. And so we have to have that good quality so that we can't be criticized in that regard and still follow those technical issues. But I think that there may be some lobbying PM that needs to be done to find out necessarily, maybe through diplomatic channels, why those countries voted the way they did and whether it was just that they, they, they felt that CBD shouldn't be this or, 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 or those other things. They wanted to stop this synthetic drug from gaining market access. I want to really get a much bigger passport and I'm hoping there can be a supplement, maybe maybe Martin uh, or, or, or somebody could give us some aspect on that so it could better allow us to, to, to know how to penetrate the international market, which is an important thing. And by and large, um, the tourism market, I think you can see a lot of people coming to St. Vincent, see the volcano. Uh, um, we, 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 we're going to be marketing good herbal products for them. Thank you very much, Gerald. I'm sure T and I will be really pleased that you put in some more work in their direction. Um, Faith, yeah. <laughs> would you like to... Uh, pick up any of the any of the points Gerald's made and, and answer some of the, the questions. Yeah, yes. Um, actually, health and wellness tourism, I think it is, that, is, that is one of the ways that we must go. I mean, right now in Jamaica, we have um, provision for tourists or visitors to access, but I think it needs to be much easier for access. So that is something that we're looking to change, you know, because otherwise we, we won't be able to develop that sector. And um, definitely nutraceuticals, I mean, I believe that there is a there is a safe way of, of 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 producing edibles, right? And so I believe that that is the way we ought to go because the market really wants that. You know, ed edibles you want to call it nutraceuticals, you can call it that, but there is a way. And of course, looking beyond just the cannabis itself, but the, the waste from cannabis. I mean, biomass. You know, there are poten there's potential there, energy and that kind of thing. So. These are some opportunities that arise. I do believe though that what would really help, and we really don't see the, in, the industry thriving with, without the small farmer. 
And so it would be certainly um, welcome if the, the banking situation, because, because it, we have to be real and realistic. Um, capital is necessary for any venture, right? And that, that additional support, especially in times like these, would really be necessary. You know what I mean? And the testing capabilities that are required also to tap into those external export markets and so on, the, that, that's, a, that's an expensive venture. And in Jamaica, we don't have the capacity in any one place. So now we're seeking to find other means of the getting the testing done so that we can have safe consumption locally and for export. Okay, thank you, Faith. And then um, just uh, maybe a couple of uh, minutes, Vicky, final response on this question, if you'd like to speak to it. Yeah, I, I think the market space is multiple, not just tourism, but multiple. And that is why for, for, for me, the importance of intellectual property and branding and inclusion of branding is where the small traditional farmers will have their cut and their space. I made a comparison with reggae music. It is the same. It's, it's what is it that we are branding and selling? Because we're, it, once it opens up and it will open up, what competitive advantage are we bringing to the table? And which I think why it is important that that report that was done, even the current report, but the one that was done by yourself, Dave, and Sylvia and Martin on fair trade, is an important conversation to have at the table because there are other issues that go into deciding and working with, within any market space that we choose to. The issue of gender, the issue of how we treat with human rights. And all of that is encompassed in the branding element. And some regulatory framework must be set to treat with those intellectual property rights because there are other, other things that will prevent access for your TC, your traditional cultivators or your small farmers from coming into whatever market space I feel you were. Okay, thank you, Vicky. And Payne, would you like to uh, speak to this point? Well, just a brief comment. Um, I, think, I think there is quite some potential in developing a regional Caribbean market, uh, because of the fact that there's quite some other places where cannabis is not uh, grown and or hard to grow because of the climate or the land and the soils. So, I mean, as a first step, it would be interesting. And I think St. Vincent is already looking into that to develop some kind of regional market for this, for this, for this, in this first phase of uh, developing responses. Uh, as the CARICOM report also suggested, and I think there are quite some other points in there that could be taken into account. And I would really like to have some more Caribbean voices heard in the in the CND uh, because of their, their, there's very few of them. So yeah, that's basically what I want to add. Okay, brilliant. Thanks a lot, Pien. So um, the clock certainly has beaten us. In fact, we've, we've lost our race because we're nearly uh, um, 10 past the hour. So it just remains for me to um, say thank you to all our wonderful panellists today. And at this point, I think it would be appropriate for everyone to switch on their microphones and a quick round of applause, if that's at all possible. I don't know if that will actually work, but anyway, yeah. <laughs>